didn't expect so much chanting on such an early morning on a Friday, but it is the feast of St. Joseph during this year of St. Joseph, and special graces are granted today to those who honor Joseph coming to Mass and celebrating this beautiful Mass and the devotions afterwards. And so we give thanks to God this day for this beautiful feast and this incredible year dedicated to St. Joseph. A year for us to reflect upon this incredible man, his life, his closeness to God, to also to reflect upon our devotion to him and to begin to be more active about asking his powerful intercession for our world. I don't think it was any mistake that during the last apparition in Fatima, as everyone in the crowd was seeing the miracle of the sun, the children had seen Our Lady as Our Lady of Sorrows, Our Lady of uh, the Ro- uh, Our Lady of the Scapular, uh, Mount Carmel. But then they also saw Saint Joseph holding the child Jesus and blessing the world. Saint Joseph has many, many titles, and one of them is Protector of the Church. And certainly, we need his powerful protection at this time. Who is this man, Joseph? Well, if we were to look to the Gospel of Matthew and we follow that lineage of so-and-so was the father of so-and-so was the father of so-and-so, we trace Joseph's lineage right back to King David. St. Joseph was of the royal line of David. You know, David had many sons, but it was his son Solomon who was proclaimed king, and then it was the sons from that line of Solomon that were proclaimed kings. So in that royal line descended from Solomon, we have Joseph. He's a direct descendant in the line of kings. Perhaps if the kings of the Davidic kings were still on the throne, they'd been dethroned about 150 years before Jesus, Joseph may have been reigning as king, as he was the direct descendant of the royal house of David. And we saw in that first reading the promises made to King David. And it says here about, Go to my servant David, when your time comes to rest with your ancestors, I will raise up your heir after you, sprung from your loins, and will make his kingdom firm. Now this is about Christ, the one who will be the great king, but it's from the royal line, of which Joseph is of that royal line. Beautiful when you think about the promise God made 1,000 years before to David is fulfilled in Christ, but through the beautiful intercession or the beautiful faith of Joseph. Now, Joseph, we're told by outside sources, outside the scripture, uh, being a good and just and holy man, uh, was chosen among others to uh, perhaps be one of those who'd be chosen to be the chaste spouse of Our Lady. Sometimes they show Joseph as an old man, you know. Well, (laughs) probably not. (laughs) So Joseph was chosen, we're told, from various other sources. And these men came forward who would be those who would uh, marry Our Lady, enter into a chaste virginal marriage with her, which is according to the book of Deuteronomy. That was a normal thing that would happen with women who wanted to enter into marriage but be consecrated to the Lord. They would enter a chaste marriage. And so the men presented their staffs and Joseph's bloomed lilies. That's now a tradition of the church. It's not doctrine, but it's a beautiful tradition, which is why we often see Joseph holding a staff with lilies, as you see he is here, holding a staff of lilies. It was a symbol of his purity, that this man was not only a just and good man, but a pure man who would be able to truly enter into this marriage with Our Lady and protect her. Now, Our Lady was just a young girl at the time. No one knew much about her. She wasn't walking around with a big sign that said, I am the Immaculate Conception. I'm going to be the Mother of God. It was all news to her, too, when it all came to pass. But we know that after the angel appeared to Our Lady, she shared with Joseph that she was with child, by the Holy Spirit. And Joseph, being a just man and a righteous man, was also a humble man. He knew that he was not worthy to have the new ark of the new covenant in his house. 
It's often believed that somehow Joseph thought Mary sinned and he was angry at her and was going to divorce her quietly because he was a good guy. But that's not the case. The truth is Joseph did not believe himself to be worthy to be the one who would be the foster father of our Lord, to bring into his home the new ark of the new covenant, to care for Mary and Jesus. We know that because when the angel comes to Joseph in his dream, he says to Joseph, do not be afraid. Now in English, we have one word for fear. But in the Hebrew, the word fear was a reverential fear, a fear that he wasn't worthy. It was the same fear that was used when King David, his great, 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 great grandfather, was afraid of bringing the Ark of the Covenant into his house. A reverential fear of unworthiness. That's what the word meant. So Joseph did not believe that Mary had sinned, and that's why he wanted to divorce her, and in an angry rage... He was actually humbled by the fact that his was that she was to be the mother of God, and he understood that he was not worthy to have her into his home. And so the angel comes to him in a dream. Now, poor Joseph only wrote on dreams, right? Everything, every time the Lord spoke to him, the angel came to him in a dream. This is very much in line with Old Testament scriptures like his great-great-great-great-great-grandfather going all the way back, Joseph, of, Na- of uh, the son of, not who would be a great-grandfather, but kind of distant uncle, <laughs> who was the uh, one in, who God spoke to him in dreams in Egypt. And also Prophet Daniel. God speaks to them sometimes in dreams. And so he spoke to Joseph in a dream. And he tells him basically, yes, you are worthy. You are to be Uh, the foster father of the Son of God. Do not be afraid to take Mary, your wife, into your home, for it is through the Holy Spirit that this child has been conceived in her. She will bear a son, and you are to name him Jesus, because he will save his people from their sins. Now think about that reality. Here he thinks himself so unworthy to be the foster father of the Son of God, And yet he is the one who is going to stand up in the temple when Jesus is consecrated as a baby and Joseph is going to pronounce his name to the whole world. Yahshua, Jesus, God saves. It will be Joseph who will be the first to pronounce in public the holy name of Jesus. Jesus awoke and did as the angel told him to do. He loved Mary with his whole heart. He loved her as a wife. Although it was a chaste relationship, he guarded her, protected her, provided for her, cared for her. And I'm sure he journeyed with her to the hill country of Judah when she went to go visit Elizabeth. I don't think he let her go alone. I think Joseph was there and just bowed his head as Our Lady sang her Magnificat. And then he listened to the Benedictus of Zechariah when John the Baptist was born. And Joseph, when the day came, led Our Lady to Bethlehem, his home city. There in Bethlehem, the birthplace of King David, there our Lord Jesus Christ was born. I have this image in my head of uh, Jesus being born and then Mary presenting Jesus to Joseph. You know, Pope John Paul II said that every mother knows the child before he's born, and it's the mother who has to introduce the child to the father. (laughs) Because the mother already knows the baby, but she has to introduce the baby to the father. And Joseph, although he was our Lord's foster father, was to be introduced to Jesus. Moses was not allowed to look upon the face of God. The people of Israel held back from the mountain because they felt they were not worthy to hear God's voice. And yet, hear Joseph, this man, thinking himself someone worthy, was to be handed God. I'm sure Our Lady had to hold his chin up and say, it's okay, you can look upon the face of God. And reaching out his hands, she placed the Son of God gently into the arms of Joseph. And there, Joseph fell in love, looked into the eyes of God himself, The eyes that saw the foundation of the world look into the eyes of Joseph. 
the hands that held back the Red Sea, hold his finger. The mighty God enthroned upon the cherubim now rests in his arms. Eventually he'll smile and coo at Joseph and learn to call Joseph Abba, Dad. To think about that, here is Joseph, a mere man, and God, the eternal Son of the Father, creator of heaven and earth, the God whom he worships, the God to whom he offered the sacrifice of the Lamb every year as a faithful Jew, the God to whom he prays, the God to whom he entrusts himself, the God whom he has been devoted to since his childhood. God looks up to him and begins to form the words, Abba, Abba, Daddy, Daddy. Our Lady would have been teaching Jesus to form the words Abba, Abba, to Joseph. A relationship is formed between Jesus, the eternal Son of God, and Joseph. Jesus will look to Joseph truly as his father. And as most sons imitate their fathers in the way they walk, the way they do things, the way they carry themselves, the way they speak, so Jesus would have imitated Joseph in all these things. One day, my brothers and I were out walking with my father, and I stopped and started laughing. And they said, what? I said, we walked just like him. <laughs> and how true it is. Jesus would have learned to be a man from Joseph. Not just to work with carpentry rules, but customs of life. Things about the world. He knew all of it already, but he sat at the feet of Joseph and chose to learn from him everything. He would have been most like Joseph. You know, we have no words in Scripture from Joseph. Not one word. A priest once joked and said, Well, what do you have to say? You have breakfast every morning with the Blessed Virgin Mary and the Son of God. What do you have to add to the conversation? Good point, good point. I'm just going to be quiet, you know. How tough it was being the only guy in the house with original sin, you know. Who broke the vase? Blame the guy with sin, <laughs> you know. Being able to, you know, say to the Son of God, take out the trash. <laughs> or not be able to say to the Son of God, you know, what do you think, you know everything? Well, he did. <laughs> Joseph spent his life protecting our Lord and our Lady. He fled to Egypt and lived for seven years in a foreign country to protect him. Hiding in Egypt. When returning to Jerusalem, he would not go back to Bethlehem because he knew that Herod's son had taken the throne and, and he was afraid and the angel warned him, don't go back to Bethlehem. So he settled in Nazareth in the quiet. There took up his trade as a quiet carpenter. Lived daily life. And Jesus was so associated with Jesus, Joseph that when Jesus began his public life, they said, isn't this Jesus the son of Joseph the carpenter? And he was happy to be known as the son of Joseph. Their relationship can never be spoke of enough. How many nights did they sit up outside and just talk? When he was a child, a teenager, through his 20s. Remember, Jesus didn't leave home till he was 30. All those years with Joseph, all those conversations, what they shared with each other, the talks that they had. Perhaps Jesus taught Joseph to pray after jo Joseph had taught Jesus as a child. A great mystery. St. Joseph dies before our Lord's public ministry. Why? Well, first of all, his mission of protecting our Lord was over. Our Lord had to go forth to his death and offer himself in sacrifice. And so Joseph had to lay down his protective staff and allow him to go to his death. Joseph also had to step down because it was time for the king, the true king, to come forward the rightful heir to the throne of Jerusalem. And so the old king would pass as the new king would come to take his throne upon the cross of Calvary. But in my heart, I think, the reason why Joseph died before our Lord's public ministry, before the crucifixion, is because I do not think that Joseph could have bared watching Our Lady suffer on Calvary. I think he could take watching our Lord suffer. I think he could have withstood that. But I, don't, I think he loved Our Lady so much 
that he could never have withstood watching her in her agony, knowing her heart, knowing how much she loved Christ, knowing how much she would be suffering in her immaculate heart. There's no way he could have endured it. And so God, in his mercy, took Joseph before our Lord began his public ministry. And Joseph had the most beautiful of deaths. What more beautiful death could there be than to fall asleep into the arms of our Lord and our Lady? The last thing he beheld in this world was the face of Jesus and the face of Mary. How beautiful. Joseph, this beautiful, righteous, good man who spent his life in service of Our Lady and Our Lord Jesus Christ. Every minute of his day, every thought, everything he did, 